So this is a project of ours which we've been doing for a while at Red Hat. And we want to obviously tell you about it. You. you can't hear me? No. no. Can you? you can try speaking louder. So once again, we are going to talk about a project that we've been doing for a while at Red Hat. Uh, it's called CKI, which is sometimes pronounced cookie. And I'm Nikolai Kondrashov. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. And uh, well, otherwise, I uh, maintain a UGMAN project and uh, do embedded and uh, electronics as a hobby. Uh, so my name is Major. Uh, I've been at Red Hat for about a year. Before that, I worked a lot in OpenStack. Um, and I own a lot of domain names. So has anybody ever used ICANHASIP.com before? Oh. A few. Okay, cool. All right, I've run that one uh, in a very terrible way. But don't give any other ideas of domain names to buy. Every time in a talk, someone gives me an idea. So I didn't want to get there. Okay, so uh, as Nikolai talked about, uh, we as a group have built this project called Continuous Kernel Integration, CKI. And it's um, a group of folks from around the world who come together uh, to change the way that we test kernels. And so we call it cookie. Uh, and someone stopped me in the hall earlier and said, what kind of cookies are you talking about? I was like, oh, you mean like the variety, like what the flavor is? And they're like, no, no, what does a cookie mean to you? And I was like, what do you mean? Like it's a, it's a sweet cookie or whatever. And so it made me think of something that um, when Samsung first set up the uh, emoji for cookie, uh, they were the only ones who set it up as, a, as what I would call a cracker, you know, that you'd put something on. And so when we talk about cookies, we're talking about all the other ones that are up here. These are ones that you would want to have. Uh, and that would improve your day. <laughs> and so th that actually made it really funny because uh, uh, for all the people that use Samsung, uh, when Cookie Monster was talking about how much he loved cookies, all of a sudden there's a bunch of crackers on there. Sorry. <laughs> so when we talk about cookies, we're talking about the sweet things that you like to eat. So everything behind this talk is, is about maintaining stable kernels and how hard that is. So how many people in here run the stable kernel directly from Greg's tree on their computers? OK, a few. How many of y'all run mainline? Uh, about the same. Okay, being a little brave. Okay, so this is very difficult, and one of the reasons for that is is that you don't see a lot of the bugs that go into upstream kernels until it's taken a long time for it to come down. So if you think about it, it goes into some developer's next tree, and then Linus merges it in. Then you get to the point where Linus says, "Let's do a release," and it ends up in an RC, and then finally it will end up as a stable kernel that Greg will maintain for a period of time. And so that creates a lot of problems. So as I think about this, let's say you're a developer, you write a patch set, it gets merged into mainline. And so this is where patches will go before they get brought into the next kernel release. Not a lot of people are gonna be running that right off the bat. A lot of people are gonna use kernels from their distribution or use a stable kernel perhaps. And so that patch goes in there and time passes. Could be a month, could be a couple of months. Um, finally, that patch set becomes part of Greg's uh, stable kernel release which a lot of OS distributions will go and, and pick up and work with. Uh, and also, I, Greg is probably one of the most efficient kernel developers on Earth. He moves more patches than anybody I've ever seen, and then he also can respond to an email in like 15 minutes. I don't know how he does it. I can't do my email at all. Uh, and so then more time will pass. Those patches will sit in that stable kernel for a certain period of time. Uh, and then eventually, like a Linux distribution maintainer will pick it up, and they'll find an issue. They'll find a security issue or a performance issue or something like that. And they'll eventually narrow it down to that patch. And that's after doing git bisects, tons of compiles. Sometimes performance issues can take hours or days to tease out. And so that's a lot of extra work. And so then the distribution maintainer says, well, let me contact the original developer and find out where they were going with this or, or what the original direction of that is. And usually time will pass because that developer has other things to do. And then finally, the original developer will reply, but they can't remember why they wrote the patch or what it was for. It was maybe to fix one small bug that they found in a corner case, or maybe create some support for new hardware. And they're like, I haven't worked with that hardware. I'm on a new team. There's other people that do it. I, I can't help you. I'm sorry. And so for a, for a maintainer of this kernel, especially if you work on an OS, it's really frustrating. Because then you get these bug reports, and you're like, I have you know, 1,200 kernel commits I've got to go through to find this one problem that this person reported to me on this one piece of hardware. And it could be really frustrating. 
So the question we wanted to ask and the question we asked ourselves was, uh, what if we could find that patch before it ever made it in? And so that opens up a whole lot of additional questions of like, how do we uh, take a look at these patches before they ever get merged in the tree? And how can we test them adequately enough so we actually know um, if we found a problematic one or if the patch is fine? So naturally, we build a kernel CI. Uh, what we do is we watch uh, kernel mail lists. Uh, we look, use Patchwork. How many of you know what Patchwork is? I guess most of you know. Not many, actually. OK, so Patchwork is a system which watches uh, a mail list or a bunch of them, picks out the patch series that are posted there, uh, parses them, figures out what's a cover letter, what are the uh, tags that are put on commits, like act by or reviewed by, then puts it all into a database and provides a web interface so that uh, maintainers and uh, contributors can take a look at those patches, uh, mark some status on those patches, check the status, or do some manipulations with those that are done during the maintainer's workflow. Uh, and that that system, the patchwork system, also has an API which lets us watch the mail lists, specific mail lists uh, for specific kernel <laughs> trees, notice when there is a new submission, and pick it up, then put it into our GitLab pipeline where we uh, merge it, test it, uh, and then generate an email report and send it back to the mail list, replying to the original serious thread. So the people who were concerned with that series would know, like the contributor, whoever was copied on these messages, the maintainer, they would know that there was a test run and its results. We don't normally send the failures to the mail list. We send, uh, pardon me, uh, successes to the failure to the to the mail list. We send the failures to the mail list only. So it's a uh, low traffic, uh, and uh, people are only alert if something failed. Uh, we also do test commits to the, to the kernel tree repositories themselves, and we maintain a notion of the baseline of uh, where the kernel is considered working so that we can uh, differentiate from patch failures due to test failures due to test issues and uh, test failures due to, the, to whatever is in the git tree which we are basing, which we are applying the patches to. Uh, underneath GitLab, we're using OpenShift to download those kernels, merge the patches, and build those kernels, and that lets us uh, really shorten the build time. Like It's like five minutes now? Yeah, five, six, yeah. Five, six, and we are talking about building uh, several architectures at once. Uh, then, when the kernels are built, we hand them off to the Beaker system, and the Beaker is a system for maintaining the inventory of uh, all the hardware that we have available for testing, and including uh, the machines themselves, the peripherals that they have, uh, the parameters of the CPU, architecture, stuff like that. It also maintains the distributions that we have for testing that we can install those machines. It gives us the ability to turn machine on and off and install the operating system. It's very convenient for us. And most importantly for our testing, it also has uh, support for specifying which hardware do you want. So for example, if you want a specific architecture, you can say that. If you want a specific CPU, you, want, you can say that, which allows us to target uh, tests to specific hardware. And this has been uh, one of the biggest part of Red Hat value through all the history, is the, um, the amount of testing that we do and the amount of testers that we have, the amount of people who maintain the tests, and the amount of people who um, write new tests, and the sheer amount of work that's done for every release testing whatever we produce. And we, of course, have lots of hardware which we test on because we have partners that we care about and because we just have clients that we care about. Uh, speaking of which, so far we have onboarded a few, well, a number of test suites. And these are not just separate tests. These are test suites like LTP Lite, which has a ton of tests or KVM unit test, which is uh, for KVM testing, or Connectathon NFS test, which has a lot of tests as well. Uh, and there's a number of smaller tests. Right now, testing upstream. 
And for architectures, we obviously have x86-64 with AMD and Intel, uh, but I guess nothing more extreme. Uh, we have the whole zoo of AR-64. Uh, we have IBM Power 8 and Power 9 with PPC-64. And finally, we have the rarest of them all, the rarest Pokemon is IBM mainframes and that's 390X. So, and even, even on x86-64, there is a great zoo of all the hardware that we can test with and uh, all kinds of uh, type, like, types of machines, including the laptops, workstations, and servers. And of course, sometimes you even need to test on virtual machines, like specific changes, like to KVM, for example. And uh, for peripherals, we have hardware ranging from desktop class, like audio cards, just basic, uh, basic network cards and uh, GPUs, but then up to the enterprise class with InfiniBand adapters, storage controllers, and uh, high-performance network cards and high-performance GPUs. And what's more, we can target those specifically on Beaker when we want to. So we want to get into talking about what we're doing for upstream kernels today. Um, so when we originally had this conversation about going upstream, we thought, man, we have to do this right. Because um, kernel developers are very particular about how they want to communicate. Everything happens on the mailing list. If it doesn't happen on the mailing list, it never happened. That's one thing I've, I've learned the hard way. And then also, you don't send anything to the mailing list unless you have all your stuff together first. So we had to make sure that our results that we were sending were complete, they were accurate, and it contained the right information for a kernel developer to go back and say, oh, okay, I can compile with the same options and the same config you had and get the same kernel. So uh, we decided we would have a conversation with Greg KH and see if we could join in testing some of the stable kernel work. So there's already some other groups in there. Uh, Lenaro um, is doing some work. Uh, Google's doing some work with Syscaller. Um, there's, some, there's some other groups that are participating, but we said, look, we want to bring something a little bit different. We want to do multi-arch. We want to do some different tests that other people aren't running. And he said, sure, that's great. Send it to the mail list. And we were like, well, what do you want sent? He's like, just send what you got. And so we said, OK. Um, and the funny thing was is that uh, he would constantly give us feedback. Anytime we messed up, he would reply in less than like 10 minutes, telling us exactly what he liked and didn't like, uh, which scared us at first because we thought he was going to get mad. But no, actually, he, he wanted to send the feedback, and he wanted us to change quickly. So we started sending these emails. Um, and so we would go through, and the emails would contain really basic stuff at the top. And we started testing his RC releases. So uh, he's got a workflow where he will prep an RC. So like, let's say if he's putting out 4.20.1, he'll make a tag, he'll do an RC, he'll get everything ready, but he won't put it you know, into production or release anything yet. Uh, and he'll ask people to do tests on it. And so we said, well, why don't we just start running tests on that repo? Um, so what we do is we uh, send through a result that says, you know, hey, what is the overall result? Did it compile okay? Did all the kernel tests run? Really basic. And then we also provide ways to reproduce the same compile that we did. So we go and share and say, here's the exact config we used. Here's the make options we used. You can go run this uh, on your own. And so we also go through all the different hardware testing that we offer right now. And all the tests are open source. So if anyone says, hey, I want to run that test as well, it's there and you can go run it. Uh, so you can compile the kernel, get the same exact one that we had, and then go run it. And we actually offer up the kernel that we built. You can actually just take it from the tarball if you don't want to go compile it yourself and run with that. And so then after that, we said, hey, wait a minute. What if we went earlier in Greg's workflow? So Greg has a workflow that's earlier than that, where he has a separate repo called stable Q, uh, and he takes patches and he puts them in a directory, uh, and it's kind of like the patch list will get bigger and smaller as people do testing and argue about whether a patch needs to go in or not. Sometimes this will have 20 patches in it, sometimes it'll be 100, sometimes more than that. Um, and so what we said was, hey, every time he changes that repo, let's just test it and give him feedback before he even makes an RC. Um, so now every time he makes a change to that repo, within about 15 or 20 minutes, we begin tests. So we can actually give him feedback before he even thinks about building an RC. And so we go through and we, re we report um, all the patches that he has uh, in the folder in the order that he originally wanted them placed in. And so that way we can give him that feedback uh, you know, before he goes and makes an RC that's going to have a lot of problems. 
So I talked about patchwork, but this is something that we, so far, we use in, inside Red Hat only. And there's one simple reason for that, is that uh, while we test the, whatever Greg is working on, we trust Greg. But if you want to work with patchwork, you've got to expose yourself to patches sent by anybody and run that code on your hardware. So right now we are figuring out how to do that. And obviously people are doing similar things already with running, running tests on code that's been posted there. It's just a matter of uh, figuring out how we're gonna do it. Uh, so inside Red Hat we have, the, we, we watch patchwork and Git and we have the extra link stage where we check if the emails sent to the mail list are up to the process and have all the required information in there. So we think that we can also use that upstream to run check patch or whatever is necessary and to so alert the developer sooner than the uh, maintainer has to go in there and see it for themselves. Uh, so what, what else we are, we are working on is, of course, we are always adding new tests and uh, the list that you've seen is, is smaller than what we have internally. We still have some tests that we need to work on to prepare for uh, putting them outside and some tests might never make it because they're secret source but hopefully we'll be able to open source most of them. Uh, we want to test more trees. Uh, <clears throat> and we want to reduce the latency that the, that, that, uh, the that time that goes between a person submitting a series to the time when they receive the report. Because it is important for developers, well, as you know, why, why we all have CI, so that we get the response as soon as possible so that we may keep, keep the same information in our heads as we were working as on that patch to start with, and we can quickly respond and fix our things, not, uh, as Major said, half a year later when we forgot all about that patch. So we, need to, we are constantly driving that time shorter and shorter. And furthermore, we want to uh, <coughs> open parts of our process and uh, our data and code. We have some code still inside Red Hat, which shouldn't, and we are putting it outside. We have a big part of the code outside already. We want to have the issue tracker outside Red Hat and open to the public. Uh, we want to have perhaps uh, meetings outside on IRC in public. Uh, want to send logs from the tests and the console logs outside when we send reports. Uh, we can easily do that right now, of course, and we do that inside Red Hat, but uh, the problem is that the logs can contain some confidential information like, like special hardware, which we are not allowed to talk about yet, or details of infrastructure. Uh, and then we need to put out more docs documentation for the people who have seen a failure so that they can more easily go and run that exact test with exact parameters as we ran them. We're already starting doing that and we're going to improve on that. So if you'd like to have your tree tested, uh, if you're a maintainer or if you work with a maintainer and you want them to, to do that, basically send us an email, uh, tell us what you want to do, which tree you want to test. We'll see how that aligns with the targets that we have for L for what we're doing. And if that works out, we'll just start testing it and sending you emails. Uh, and if you have any tests uh, that you want us to run, and I know there are some people which have right here, right now, uh, again, send us a message. We will see how, how it works with RHEL and with, with what we are doing. And we um, work with you to write a wrapper for your test so that we can run it on Beaker and in our system. Uh, and then basically we run it and uh, we'll ask you to maintain it because we, we don't scale <laughs> to all the tests. <laughs> and uh, we will of course help you figure out what was wrong in, in our system if it's our fault, but otherwise we will need to work with you to maintain your test. And uh, it's, it's not a big deal if it breaks, we will have a system in place where we can just disable the test for a while so that you have time to fix it and uh, we don't throw it away. We will work with you to make it work. And so usually at the end, someone will always ask, well, like, you're, you're putting out a lot of hardware, you're putting out a lot of work. 
so why does Red Hat want to do this? Well, in the end, we want to make better RHEL. And we realized that one of the only ways to do that, if we want to have a more secure uh, operating system, it starts with the kernel. If we want more performance, it starts with the kernel. And so that means we have to go outside of what we're currently doing. We have to go upstream. We have to start working there and stopping the problems, not only before they get to us, but before they get to other distributions as well. Like we should find a common way that we can do that so no one else has to go through the pain. Because it doesn't make a lot of sense for a kernel developer at Red Hat and SUSE and, and Canonical and wherever all working through the same issue, but they're not communicating with each other. We'd rather do that in the upstream. And so finally, if you do want to get involved, uh, we have some projects in GitHub, some projects in GitLab, but you can always email us with any questions that you have. Um, or if you want to add a test, as we said before, or if you want to add your tree, uh, that would be great. We'd rather not go directly to maintainers and say, please add your stuff. What we would love is for people to, uh, that constantly work with a certain tree, to basically go to that maintainer and say, hey, look, we should get the same testing here. I would like to not have to do this on my own laptop or my own server or the set of servers or whatever. I would just like to have someone else do this and give us the results in a consistent way. And so with that, we want to tell you thanks. And then we also do have some real cookies uh, to give away. If you ask a good question, maybe. Uh, is there any coordination with the zero build uh, bot that Intel provides and runs and compiles a lot of tests from uh, patches that are stuck to the maintenance? Uh, so the question was if there is any interaction with the Intel's test bots, right? Yeah, like, are you running the same test or different tests like they do? Because the service is quite similar that they are doing. Yes, it is, it is similar. I don't think we have co coordination with them. We have so many tests to, uh, to put in the open that we developed inside and that, that we are using from the open source community that we just haven't, haven't started doing that. I don't know if that's gonna be possible. So there was, there was a conversation at, um, at Plumbers in November, because uh, there was folks there from um, Syscaller and then the Lenaro uh, folks who were doing kernelci.org were there as well. And so we were all having an argument about what is the best way to provide um, the output. Because that's the big question, is like the output from everyone looks different. And the feeling from the kernel maintainers is that you're just blasting us with emails from all directions. And it's great, like we never had feedback, now we do, and we need to organize it into something. Um, and so I think the argument came back around to kernel developers said, well, if it's not on the mailing list, I'm not gonna look at it. And so then we were like, well, so we have to keep sending it to the mailing list. And they said, well, we don't want it to the mailing list. And so then it kind of went in a cycle. So there's some arguments going back and forth about uh, some of the maintainer trees, like some of the next trees, going into something like GitLab or going into something like that to where the feedback could be provided directly there based on the commit. Um, but then, of course, that opens up a whole lot of arguments for and, and against. There's a lot of workflows that would be disrupted um, and some people feel like it would make it harder to contribute if you had to work through another system uh, other than none of us. But isn't the zero build bot actually not doing what you are trying to do? The same as the zero bot you use only VMs. We are using real life. Ah, okay. That's how that's yeah, so when we, when we compile that kernel, we actually put it on uh, a, a Z13 uh, box and we will boot it and run through the test there. So there's no emulated testing of any sort. Okay. It's yeah. not a box. Well, it's a big box. <laughs> it's, very, it's very large. Uh, so I have a two-part question. Uh, how do you decide what tests to run uh, based on, I mean, you can't run all the tests, right? So which ones are most valuable to you? And two, uh, how effective does Oh, you want me to? <laughs> um, so I think it's it's a trade-off because like, um, for example, I know we were looking at one of the tests, I can't remember what it was, but it had like a four or five hour runtime. And it's like, okay, well that's good. There's like good results there, but do we really want to drag that out because then it's more hardware getting used. It takes longer to get your feedback. Like that test had better be good. And so uh, Nikolai and some other folks on the team got together and said, hey, wait a minute. Couldn't we look and see where the patch is in the kernel? And then based on that, let's run the test. And so if a developer's changing something about how a Raspberry Pi manages its serial console, maybe we don't need to test the file systems. You know, that's not a big deal or whatever. But if we had tests for a serial console, okay, maybe that's a great time to go in there and make sure that, that still works. So I think that's part of it. Um, and then the other half, um, I've forgotten your second half. How, how effective has it been to find for 
So we found some like really oddball things. We found some obvious things that if someone had just sat down, like um, I think in the middle of 4.20 development, I think it was, um, basically all the architectures could not be compiled except for x86. Um, someone in our group found that, uh, I think it was config repline, uh, was only set on x86-64 and there's no concept of it outside of x86-64. So when you went to compile on power, it would hit that, that spot and it's like, what are you talking about? This doesn't exist. Um, and that actually stayed in for like two weeks. But nobody noticed it probably because the vast majority of the development is on x86. Um, and so we find some of those things like really quickly uh, just because we're able to compile it. We, we found some other things. There, there's of course a lot of merge failures. A lot of merge, yeah. <laughs> and then there was this story with Greg just recently. Oh yeah, so, um, <laughs> so I guess now that there's a few kernel CI groups that are doing work with Greg, uh, he dropped in a patch that would intentionally cause a kernel panic because he wanted to see if people were paying attention. And so we caught it, and then I can't remember who on the team, I think it, Rachel might have brought it up, and then another member of the team was like, oh yeah, look at this right here, and he found the patch, and it was just a one-liner throwing in a panic in there. Uh, but it threw us into a panic because it was like, everything failed, you know, what is this, you know, in a stable kernel, this shouldn't happen. Uh, and then I emailed Greg, and I was like, nicely done, nicely done. I mean, <laughs> and of course he replied back, and he's like, I'm glad you're paying attention. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we've we found some interesting stuff so far. Some other stuff with huge pages. Uh, we had one with like arm moving huge pages between Newman nodes and stuff like that. Might I ask that? Yeah. So to answer your first part of the question, <laughs> again, this is real specific, so a lot of the testing will focus on what's in the interest of a raw customer. Yeah. So we have something like a Raspberry Pi console, we have like maybe for the premises. That, that's where our focus is in the, the priority. Please go ahead. Do you want to make this uh, more possible? So, because right now you're providing a service and not really a software, uh, but you're also providing a software but, uh it depends on the meter, and that's pretty much on the Dora or Bell. Uh, so, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not portable, it's portable across architectures, but not across distributions or uh, across other, other um, systems of organizing. So the question was, uh, are we planning to make it more portable to other distribution systems, whatever, just, just taking it outside Red Hat, people could run it? So this is a difficult question. We are, of course, putting everything outside in the open source as much as we can. And uh, yes, Beaker is open source, but nobody actually installed it outside Red Hat, I think. People might have tried. Uh, and this, this again ties in uh, with, uh, with the way we, we to, to the huge amount of hardware that we have and the way that our systems are tied to the management of that hardware. Kind of the, the fact that we have that, all that special hardware and the fact that we need to manage it in our special way kind of ties us into that. But we still have parts of, parts of the system which we try to keep separate and independent, which could be reused, and we are putting them outside we have a big part of it and we put, put in more of that. And uh, as we uh, reach our goals and we boost, the, boost our coverage and everything, we'll be able to concentrate on making it nicer. So hope, hope that helps. We are open to accepting patches. Of course we are open to accepting patches, only you will have a hard time testing this all. But still. But, we but have, having it, oh sorry. Yeah, ahead. we have lots of test suites which help us accept contributions. But having it be a service also adds one extra component, as we found when we were starting, when we were getting started, that it gives us tight control over anything that's not the kernel uh, in the system, because we do want tight control. Because if we introduce too many variables, then we can't figure out what broke um, in the process. So some of that stuff, um, it, that was it was another thing that came up at Plumbers. Like kernel CI has has a um, a thing that you can install locally. Like you can install Jenkins with their scripts and all that kind of stuff. And then the problem that they found is that some people have their, you know, BIOSes configured differently, or they have like power management settings set up strangely or something like that. And they were getting weird variations in their tests. Um, and that was one of the reasons, is that some of the machines were just configured in 
very unusual ways, which some may argue that, that it will make it e better to test it on different platforms, but then you're going to get different results for the same kernel, and, and it's hard to narrow down exactly what it was. Why do you use the Open shift will be the kernel and launch a test instead of a GitLab CI or code review or something else? Well, we build a lot of kernels. We're actually using GitLab CI. We're using GitLab CI on our own instance. We are using it to orchestrate everything and we're using it to trigger the builds in OpenShift, but OpenShift lets us scale our building tasks better than, uh, well, I don't know. But, well, it's actually GitLab talking to OpenShift, right? So in a way, we're using GitLab, but, but OpenShift provides us a scalable way to build a lot of kernels. And internally, it's a lot easier to consume OpenShift uh, than other things, because of course you don't you don't have to think quite so much about the capital expenditures and all that kind of thing. You can consume part of a cloud and use a cloud like it's, like it's meant to be used. Um, and so that allows us to expand up and down. Or we could say, you know, I can say I need to have this many cores. I don't care what they're on, but I just need this many so I can do my compiles. And then that way we can ask for infrastructure in a really generic way. Instead of saying I must have, you know, 20 of this type of machine racked in this way with this networking config. Yeah, and then, then there's the release happens inside Red Hat and people start sending frantically like patch sets, like 100 patches and, uh, and many, many patches and then we run out of these 20 boxes and what do we do? So with OpenShift it lets us just boost it up, turn the crank a little and we get the compiles going. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, more of a comment that uh, has to one thing that worries me is this, this. Uh, So the comment was uh, that, it, uh, that it's uh, difficult to run the test that we run compared, but well, it sounds like, right? That it's difficult to run our tests compared to, for example, zero bot or... Or maybe I just get scared by the word OpenShift. Yeah, uh, yeah, OpenShift is just for building kernels, but yes, the problem is there. Right now, as I said, we don't send the test logs or anything like that. But this is on our to-do list, absolutely. And it's not only for outside, but for internal developers as well, because we have a lot of tests. And kernel developers don't know all of them. They know specific tests for what they're working on. But if, something, if they break something else, then they are in the same situation as you are. So we are working on having uh, the instructions there and having the comments there, as well as you say. But our focus right now is to just start doing it yeah, and, and, and that is good feedback. And that's why also, too, all the emails that we send, um, the ones you know, that, that go externally to the mailing list, the email address that's on there is the same one we put in the slides. So uh, we welcome any feedback like that. And that's one that we've gotten before to make it easier to reproduce. Any more questions? OK, come get your cookies. Yeah.